In 1864, the nine-year-long effort of a mysterious and chaotic painting called The Fairy Fellow's Master Stroke had finally been released to the world. However, this would not be the choice of the artist, as a troubled painter who laboured for so long on this piece had never considered this to be complete, despite the already somewhat excessive scene displayed. The name of his artist was Richard Dadd, a Victorian painter famously known for his surreal and incredibly detailed scenes that would normally depict huge crowds of people, or fairy-like creatures, and intricate fantastical scenery. The tragic irony in this work being so beautifully displayed in these numerous details was Dad's compulsive and obsessive mind that would not only hinder his ability to complete his art to his own satisfaction, but would ultimately worsen over time, as he would suffer from increasing mental illness. This work is considered by many to be his ultimate achievement, but it also tells much about the fragility of his mind that's desperate for relief, and there is much to be interpreted from it, should you know a fair bit about Richard Dad's background. When I first encountered this painting, I felt like I had been staring for hours on end, and still managing to find something new appear from nearly everywhere I looked. I was fascinated in his techniques in creating nearly endless detail, and I was eager to find more examples of his work. Along the way, I also learned about his life and experiences, which tell a tragic, frightening and compelling story that revealed much meaning in his art, particularly for his most famous painting that we see here. And today, I wanted to share that story with you and discuss not only this painting, but some of his other most captivating works of art that show an enriched technique and unique talent that sadly would never be truly recognized by their own creator. This is a story and artwork of Richard Dad. Richard Dad was born in Chatham, in Kent, England, on the 1st of August, 1817. His parents were Robert Dad, who worked as a chemist, and Mary Ann, the daughter of a shipwright. Dad's talent for painting and illustrating came to fruition early in his youth, when just a schoolboy at the independent King's School of Rochester. Later, he would train and perfect his skills at William Dadson's Academy of Art and also at the Royal Academy of Arts at age 20. During his education, he would develop friendships with numerous like-minded artists such as William Powell Frith, Augustus Egg and Henry O'Neill, a group known collectively as the Clique. He won several awards while studying and creating at the Academy, including the Medal for Life Drawing in 1840 and he would soon begin exhibiting his work during his first year. During his time, roughly around 1841, Dad would receive a commission to do the woodblock illustrations for a book called The Book of British Ballads, as well as an oil painting called Titania Sleeping, which is widely considered to be a crowning achievement of his earlier paintings. Already, we can begin to see Dad's incredibly attentive brain to detail, as even though his techniques are still not fully developed, there is still an undeniable desire to achieve lifelike characteristics in huge abundance. This painting was inspired by Act 2, Scene 2 of Shakespeare's play A Midsummer Night's Dream, where Titania is lulled to sleep by a fairy attendant. Lurking in the shadows, you can just about make out the character of Oberon, preparing to squeeze juice from a magic flower on Titania's eyelids, when this painting was exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1841, it was incredibly well received and kick-started the trademark for Dad as being a fairy painter. On that point, there is something incredibly mystical about this painting. The use of dark shades of colour, accompanied by the moonlight and starlight highlighting the characters and glistening off the dewdrops of flowers and toadstools. It really does emphasise the feeling of witnessing a dream come to life. As briefly mentioned, the details are relatively simple compared to Dad's later work, but still plentiful, particularly with the spiral of pixies and fae-like creatures arched over Titania, seemingly dancing playfully around her, whilst using flower cups as hats and trumpets. I'm also drawn immediately to the top of a painting, consisting of golden bats and pixie-like creatures looming over the scene below. For me, it creates an almost theatrical atmosphere when observed from a distance as if the scene we see presented is performed on a stage, a fantasy rendition of Shakespeare's play observed from the perspective of a dream. 
In terms of subject matter, this was an incredibly popular source of inspiration for romantic painters in this time period. Daniel MacLeese, for example, had previously treated the far more disturbing subject of the Disenchantment of Bottom, Act 4, Scene 2, a painting with somewhat of the same dynamic force and luminous colour schemes as Dad's Titania Sleeping. Despite Dad's growing local reputation and obvious talents we see presented in this work, at the same time, his style was not seen as particularly remarkable, nor more so than any other moderately gifted painter in Victoria, England, during this stylistic phase now referred to as the Fairy School. One important thing to note about Dad's rise to fame in the art world is what exactly the minds of the Victorian people were like during this time period. As it happens, the general populace had taken on a rather eager fascination in folklore, fairy tales, and even the supernatural. This could be attributed to many different factors, ranging from the emergence of spiritualist movements such as the Masons and Golden Dawn, to even the theory that availability of different hallucinogens during this time played a part. However, most historians believe it might have had something to do with people wanting to reconnect themselves to their folkloric roots. Although written by Shakespeare a couple hundred years earlier, A Midsummer Night's Dream was hugely popular with the Victorians, and around this time when gaslights had become more advanced and used for more elaborate stage productions, dramatist Douglas William Gerald would even describe these stunning gaslight displays as a fairy creation that could only be acted by fairies. Regardless of the reason for this trend and widespread interest in the folkloric past, it would prove to work greatly in Richard Dad's favour, as his beautiful scenes filled with magical detail would quickly captivate his observers. In the following June of 1842, Dad would participate in a rather grand and unexpected undertaking. After befriending a Welsh lawyer, politician, and former mayor of Newport, Sir Thomas Phillips, who was preparing for an expedition to Europe and the Middle East, Phillips was eager to document his travels with illustrations of the people and cultures he would encounter, and so he would offer to be Richard Dad's patron and investor in return for his artwork during their travels. It would be during this time that Dad would temporarily set his fairy paintings aside and produce beautifully elaborate paintings and drawings from their travels through Italy, Greece, Turkey, Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and Egypt. However, their journeys would be harsh and long, with Phillips only wishing to rest when necessary, and they would continue to trek through scorching climates and testing conditions that would often leave Dad with very little time to illustrate at all. Although we have already seen how talented Richard Dad was as an artist at this stage, it was important to note that up until this time, Dad had only previously operated in art studios without any real pressing time restraints. And although technically competent enough for his role as an illustrator, the harsh outdoor conditions and tight schedules would prove to be a huge challenge for Dad. All the paintings we see here are from the travels of Phillips and Dad. It's fascinating to see their journey brought to life by these drawings and watercolours, seeing the dramatic landscapes, ancient buildings and different cultures that must have been awe-inspiring to two Victorian gentlemen during this time, when illustrations of these climates were few and far between. Even when tested by the glaring heat and Philip's relentless hunger to keep travelling, we can see a lot of Dad's trademark techniques and detail, despite the limited colour palette he would often have to work with when observing these sandy landscapes. However, probably the most noteworthy country that Dad visited, in terms of how it would affect his life in his later years, was his travels to Egypt and cruise down the River Nile, where Dad and Philip's would encounter many archaeological sites. It was here that Dad would learn much about the ancient Egyptians and their many mystic gods, and regularly start smoking from the shisha pipes that he saw local Arabic men use, that he would affectionately name Hubbly Bubbly. In fact, it was reported that he would spend five continuous days and nights smoking water pipes. Dad eventually became convinced that the sound of a bubbling pipe was actually some form of communication. By the fifth day, he had deciphered the message, which he claimed was the ancient Egyptian god Osiris. Sure enough, Dad was beginning to show signs of his mental health increasingly becoming more unpredictable and erratic. Dad would suffer from persistent headaches and partake in increasingly odd behaviours that his travelling companion Philip suspected was simply due to sunstroke. 
During another later trip to Rome, Dad's mental state still worsened, and he would even express a near uncontrollable urge to attack the Pope during a public appearance. He would even become more violent and aggressive towards Phillips, and eventually would unexpectedly abandon his patron in Paris in the spring of 1843 to return to England. By this time, Dad's mind was on the precipice of instability. Even now, no longer in the beams of a hot Middle Eastern sun, it was clear to see that this was something stemmed from far more than mere sunstroke. In fact, Richard Dad would even openly admit to this in his writings during this time, as follows. The excitement of these scenes has been enough to turn the brain of an ordinary weak-minded person like myself, and often I have lain down at night with my imagination so full of wild vagaries that I have really, and truly, doubted my own sanity. After returning to England, his family, growing concerned of Dad's new delusional and violent behaviour, admitted him to seek the medical help of a physician who specialised in mental health, and the doctor found him to be legally not of sound mind. But unfortunately, instead of being institutionalised, Dad convinced his father that all he needed was a rest, and together they travelled to a country village called Cobham, where Dad claimed that he would disburden his mind to his father. As I briefly mentioned earlier, Dad had developed a strange fascination in the ancient Egyptian gods, in particular the god of Osiris. One important thing to note about Osiris in Egyptian mythology was that he was believed to have been killed and dismembered by his own jealous brother, Seth. The significance of this was made evident by Dad's incoming horrific and tragic encounter with his father. Dad believed himself to be under direct control of Osiris, a belief that was slowly eating away at his mind. It was on August 28th, 1843, at a chalk pit named Paddock Hole, now renamed Dad's Hole, just outside of Cobham, that his life changed dramatically. Richard Dad chose to brutally murder and dismember his own father with a knife and a razor. Due to Dad's unstable mind, he claimed to believe his own father was the devil in disguise, and due to what we now know of Osiris and Dad's fascination with him, this too could have possibly been linked. After this terrible ordeal, Dad would flee back to France, apparently still wearing the blooded clothes he wore when he killed his father, until his arrival in Calais. Richard Dad was not suspected of the murder of his father for a long time. It was not until his brother was notified of a murder that Dad was added to the list of suspects. When the police searched Dad's home in London, they found his sketchbooks full of portraits of his friends and acquaintances, each one depicted with their throats cut. These were seen as heavily incriminating evidence, but of course Dad had already fled to France by the time of his discovery. And by the time Dad had reached Paris, he would attempt to take another victim, this time an innocent fellow tourist, whom Dad again was trying to murder with a razor. But Dad was subsequently overpowered and arrested by the authorities. Dad, however, would not be non-compliant with the police, volunteering his real name immediately, and would even confess to the murder of his father. Upon waiting trial, Dad was transferred to an asylum from prison, when the authorities found secreted on his body a list of people, and I quote, who must die, with his father, of course, being number one on the list. Finally, after being tried in England for murder, in July 1844, Dad was sent to the infamous Bethlehem Royal Hospital, referred to commonly at the time by its nickname, Bedlam, which would later define a word describing uproar and confusion. Dad was 27 years old at the time of his incarceration. By the time Richard Dad was institutionalised, he was diagnosed with what is now known as bipolar disorder, previously known as manic depression. Whilst at Bethlehem Hospital, Dad was kept in a special gender-segregated secure area for what were called, and I quote, criminal lunatics, who were herded together regardless of their background or condition. In spite of Bethlehem Hospital being notorious and controversial, as most mental institutions were during this time, and in spite of Dad losing a certain sense of freedom, the doctors of the then asylum would still regularly encourage Dad to continue painting. And indeed, regardless of his unsound mind and the horrific murder he committed, Dad was a well-known artist by this time, and the London art scene was beginning to buzz with the gossip of his story, as well as his future. 
His first works during his years in asylums were therefore seen as continuations of his work from his travels with Phillips. Dad could now only paint from his memory and imagination, which could be an attribute to his increasing use of surrealism in his art during these years. The painting titled The Flight Out of Egypt, produced between 1849 to 1850, but never officially titled by Dad himself, clearly combines both his travelling experiences across exotic lands and his own fantasies and imagination. Once again, the painting is teeming with detail. Almost every single character seems to have a personality or trait that attempts to grab your attention. Some experts believe that the painting was inspired by his travels to the Dead Sea and that it tells the biblical story of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. The scene seems almost flat and two-dimensional to me, but this is possibly a result of his limitations in painting from memory rather than from real life. Dad would not limit art to the memory of his travels alone, however, as he would continue to create more oil paintings and watercolours inspired once again by Shakespearean plays, Robin Hood, and even those who worked in his care, such as Sir Alexander Morrison, who happened to also be an art collector and huge admirer of Dad's work. What many Richard Dad fanatics seem to agree on, however, is that his most alluring and strangest paintings would emerge from the mid-1850s starting with the intricate oil painting known as Contradiction, Oberon and Titania, dated between 1854 and 1858. This work highlights Dad's return to his fairy-themed paintings, but taking on a completely new and unique style. This circular painting, commonly referred to as a tondo, took four years to complete and was dedicated to Bethlehem's first resident physician superintendent, William Charles Hood, who had arrived in November 1852. Dad takes us back to the theme and story of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, except as we can see, Dad's clear and increasing thirst for detail shine through as almost every single square inch of his painting contains large to near microscopic characteristics. There are tiny figures next to huge leaves and butterflies, and towards the top of a tondo, these distortions of scale generate an exaggerating feeling of perspective. The meaning of the word contradiction in the title of his painting focuses on the apparent battle of wills between Oberon and Titania, and the conflict centers around the Indian boy we can see here. In the center of the painting, slightly to the right, we can see the character of Titania, with the boy in question holding her dress behind her. Opposite Titania, the menacing bearded man is represented as Oberon, with either an elf or fairy servant standing behind him and holding him back. On the far right, we can see the characters of Helena and Demetrius, despite Helena's efforts, their love remaining unrequited. What impresses me is the abundance of flora and nature, ranging from morning glory flowers to pine cones to butterflies and, of course, the very subtle appearance of fays and pixies. This unexpected return to fairy-themed paintings would not yet cease either, as during the time he commissioned this painting, in the background, he was spending a long and arduous effort to complete arguably his most famous painting. I'm of course referring to the fairy fella's master stroke. As I briefly mentioned in the intro, the effort to complete this painting took close to a whole decade, and even then it would not be enough, as Dad was subsequently moved from his makeshift studio in Bethlehem to be relocated at Broadmoor Hospital, another infamous British psychiatric hospital located in Berkshire. This painting is currently displayed in the Tate Gallery in London, with some of Dad's incomplete work unfortunately on full display. Most noticeably, the axe that this character is wielding still remains unfinished to this day. The rest of the painting, however, is teeming with jaw-dropping detail. The whole painting feels like some kind of hallucination or trick of a mind, as the perspective once again feels flat, yet layered at the same time. The foreground is littered with timothy grass and what appear to be hazelnuts. Daisy flowers can also be found scattered in different spots all over the painting. And although the scene is supposedly set at night, due to the night sky that we can see in the top left corner, the flowers remain fully open. What I find most interesting is the vast amount of hidden faces in and amongst the hectic scene. A disproportioned bearded man wearing a tiered crown, although expressing a dominating posture, he seems more part of a world around him, more part of a background, than as present as the other characters that we see. Even the subtle presence of anthropomorphized animals can be seen in the distance, 
Returning again to the top left hand corner, you can just about make out the bizarre character of a dragonfly or cranefly like creature playing a strange brass instrument, above a fairy playing a French horn. Most people say that they are most drawn to the little old man sitting near the centre of the painting, looking noticeably nervous or even frightened. At first, I thought this character was simply staring into space, almost afraid of what's going on around him, and trying to distance himself from it. Though after a while, I began to think that he might actually be staring at the character holding the axe, and for one reason or another, is feeling uneasy on what the woodsman is about to do. It was then the thought hit me, that perhaps the old man is in fact about to be attacked by the axe-wielding man, who I believed at first was simply only chopping the nuts on the ground. But is it possible that this scene is of a surprise attack? Although hard to determine from the perspectives that were given, this could be a possibility as a man holding the axe is facing away from us towards where the little old man is sat, in a very clear circle of a crowd. And this is what I mean about knowing what Richard Dad's life was like to see a certain significance in this painting. We know the mental burdens that he had, as well as the terrible murder that he committed on his own father. And this scene of what could be interpreted as a murder about to take place might indicate a notion of self-reflection within Dad, a way of potentially facing up to the darker side of himself and closing a chapter by expressing it through paint. Could it be possible that the fairy fella is about to commit his quote, masterstroke on the old man who could be a representation of his father in some way? This is only my own speculation however, and it's probably a bold statement to make considering that this painting was never considered to be finished. But from what we are presented, there are many other clues to indicate this as well. The mood itself seems very foreboding. The faces of the characters seem either sombre or emotionally disassociated from the situation, either smiling cheerlessly or facetiously whilst looking away, and others look ahead at the supposed fairy fella holding his axe, with glances of quiet fear or concern of what's about to transpire. After he'd stopped working on this painting, Dad wrote a poem titled Elimination of a Picture and its Subject called The Fella's Masterstroke, where he named each of the many figures, described them with a narrative, and even referencing Shakespeare's plays. The poem is very long and teeming with detail again, possibly attributed by his mental health and obsession with detail. However, I read through it a couple of times, and it took me a while to understand his vocabulary. This poem is very long, again possibly attributed to his mental health and obsession with detail. Although I read through it a couple of times, it took me a while to understand his vocabulary. And of course, given the length of the poem, I won't be able to cover each and every character that he describes. But I did find a few interesting details regarding the characters that we see in the centre of the painting. Dad describes the fairy holding the axe, at first explaining how he is chopping the nuts in half to build a chariot for his queen. But then the verse takes on a rather uneasy turn, as follows. See, tis fay, woodman holds aloft the axe, whose double-edged virtue now they tax. Do it singly, and make single double, featly and neatly, equal without trouble. The poem continues to describe the old man sitting in the middle, Below, a pedagogue appears, a critic up to sneers and jeers, and by his fawn-like ears he's wild, untamed himself, each fairy child. Although Dad wrote this poem as a way of giving context to his painting, poetry is a medium that contains the art of imagery and metaphors. Words used in poems don't always necessarily mean what they mean at face value, and I can take a few double meanings behind the words that he uses. For example, I'm very curious to know what exactly Dad meant by the woodman having a double-edged virtue. Could this mean that the character is about to turn? About to carry out his master stroke in a secretly planned murder with his axe? Even though this verse describing the old man in the middle does not seem as enigmatic, it still casts him in the light of a victim. Someone who's supposedly wise and intelligent, being mocked and disrespected for it by the mad characters around him. After Dad was moved to Broadmoor, he wrote Quasi on the back of a painting, basically indicating this work to be incomplete. We can cast many theories behind what Richard Dad truly meant behind this painting, as well as the poem that he wrote for it. 
Because he was gifted with genius, but cursed also with madness, it's hard to tell at times how coherent or sincere his descriptions of a painting actually were, and so it still largely remains a mystery. But that's what I love the most about this painting. His obsessive use of detail, which he was sometimes criticised for, is probably my favourite aspect of his work. Although burdened with acute mental health issues and probably the guilt of murdering his own father, it would not cease his talents in paint nor push him to shut the world off from his mind, which he displays so beautifully in his later work. Dan would continue working on his art and expressing himself even after moving to Broadmoor, though working less with oil paints and more with watercolours, like this painting of a Greek woman, again probably inspired by his travelling years. Unfortunately, however, this would be one of his final paintings. Broadmoor was in the midst of a typhoid outbreak during the 1880s, along with many other establishments across the nation at this time. On the 7th of January, 1886, Richard Dad passed away from what physicians would describe as an extensive disease of the lungs. He was 68 years old. Richard Dad's natural reputation as a mad artist took on a more sentimental view of his work following his death. Broadmoor Hospital alone would keep many of Dad's works on display and remain so to this day. And the legacy of his creative talents would resonate with future generations. The famous rock band Queen would also take inspiration from the Fairy Feller's Masterstroke painting, releasing a song of the same name in 1974 on the Queen 2 album. In the lyrics, Freddie Mercury writes a compelling story featuring the same characters of the painting and even references to the poem that Richard Dad wrote. Famous British author Terry Pratchett would also be inspired by Dad and this painting, referencing the fairy fellow's masterstroke in his book, The We Free Men. Pratchett would also briefly note the life and mental illness of Richard Dad. Had Dad lived at a different time when mental illness was better understood, I personally believe that his father's murder could have been prevented and Dad could have even received far better treatment. But at the same time, I can't help but think, would we have the same weird and wonderful paintings had his life been so different? Or at the very least, would I or others have different interpretations of his paintings? Again, this is something that we can only ponder on, but regardless, I find the story of Dad and his art incredibly powerful and gripping. Some have compared his art to Hieronymus Bosch, and that is certainly an artist I would love to cover at some stage, but overall, I really can't compare his work to anyone else. His mind was truly unique and relentless, made evident by his increasingly cluttered fairy worlds. But his work has continued to inspire many other artists in many different ways. There is much that we can learn from Richard Dad, not just in terms of his art, but mental health as well. As terribly sad as his life was, had it been otherwise, we may never have witnessed the fascinating dreamlike art that we see today, nor learn some importance of just how therapeutic art can be to even the most troubled mind. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting, and I hope this may inspire you to investigate more paintings by Richard Dad. I wish I could have spoken about more of his paintings, because I assure you there are many other paintings of his well worth a look should you get the chance. And just before I go, I'd like to continue the new segment called Artist Corner that I introduced in my last video, where at the end of each video I get to introduce some independent art from my viewers. I have had some incredibly jaw-droppingly beautiful art sent to me recently, and today, since we're on the topic of fairy-themed art and folklore-themed art, I thought it'd be very appropriate to introduce you to the artwork of Kim Myatt. Kim is a self-taught artist from Wales who grew up on the windy coastlines, where folklore was never far away from everyday life. She likes to use collected symbolism and motifs in her work to deeply explore human experience, memories, emotions, and archetypes. In a sense, the magical aesthetic she presents in her work is a way of expressing escape from the tough aspects and reality of life. Just looking at her art for the first time made me audibly gasp, like I, I cannot believe how beautiful her work is. I love her use of calming colours like shades of violet, mauve and purple and blue that really do resonate a feeling of wonder and enchantment. Her eye for detail and realism is simply fantastic. I especially love her technique in creating ambient lighting in this painting called Persona, where the mask she's holding gives off this almost pearl-like shine. 
Her painting called Endearment is probably my favourite so far. So many feelings crept up on me when I first saw this. Some feelings I forgot I even had when I visualised heartbreak and what it really feels like. What I value the most in art is how it can visually represent how we feel in the darkest of times, and how sometimes seeing it face on is often a way of overcoming it. And I think Kim captures this perfectly. I want to personally thank Kim for sending her art to me and telling me her story. I think she's unbelievably talented and deserves some love, so if you have a chance, please go and check out more of her work in the links I've left in the description below. And if you're watching this going, wait a minute, I'm an artist with a story to tell as well, well then I'd love to hear from you. Please send your art and a little bit about yourself to my email, blindweller at gmail.com, for a chance to feature in my next video. Thank you again for watching everyone, and hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now.